Valley Church. Hope for those who have given up on church. Hi folks and welcome to Provision, a new teaching series we have about vision in the church. This program was made possible by you, the friends and partners of Freedom Valley Church. Thank you so much for being a part of what we're doing. Always love to hear from you during the broadcast or any other time. You can write me, g at freedomvalley.org is my email address, or the church address, Freedom Valley Church, 3185 York Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 17325. I would be glad to uh, uh, answer as many of those as I can along the way. And thanks so much for watching today. I hope this matters to your provision in 2015. All right, if you take a moment and turn in your Bible with me, we're going to Hebrews chapter 12 today as we study the Word in the provision teaching series. This is our fourth installment of this series as we're working on the provision of God for His people and uh, how His provision works. I want to read from Hebrews chapter 12 with you, with you in just a moment. I have some humor for you. As you may not have guessed, um, I have a, a, a special love for blonde jokes since um, my family and I are all blondes. My wife's a blonde, my kids, all four of them are blondes. So we love blonde jokes. And uh, somebody put this on Facebook recently. Two blondes fell down a hole. One said, it's dark in here. The other one said, I don't know, I can't see. I love that joke. That's very funny. And then I have a brunette joke for you. A young brunette goes to the doctor's office and says that her body hurts whenever she touches it. Impossible, says the doctor. Show me. She takes her finger and pushes her elbow and she screams in agony. Then she pushes her knee and screams and her ankle and screams and so it goes. Everywhere she touches makes her scream. The doctor says, you're not really a brunette, are you? No, she said. How do you know? I'm really a blonde. Oh, I thought so. Said the doctor, your finger is broken. So there you go. There's the humor for the week. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed those. He Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going. I hope you found it on your device or in your Bible, whatever. And uh, let's read together from verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my children, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes each child, he ex each one he accepts as his child. Now, we're going to talk about building endurance today because if you're going to see God's provision, there's often a uh, matter of endurance involved. And endurance is part of the uh, discipline that God gives out to his children, the discipline that he corrects and instructs and builds us with. And I want to talk about the quality of endurance today because that's what the Word of God uses in this phrase uh, and uh, talks to us about how to get. And I want to focus on this. Uh, the endorsed part comes directly from Jesus. It says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a large crowd of witnesses, in verse 1, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, what the writer of Hebrews is, is writing to us here is that we have this ability to accumulate all kind of stuff in life, and it slows down our ability to run the race that God has given us. And he's saying right here in verse 1, uh, he says, listen, you're surrounded by this great crowd of witnesses, which we would imagine to be those who've passed on before in heaven. And uh, he says, uh, strip off every weight that slows you down, especially the sin that so easily trips you up. 
What he's talking about here is that life has just a way of accumulating stuff in our lives. We have a way of accumulating so much of this, of sin, of uh, issues and things that would trip up a believer in their walk with the Lord. And uh, he says, it's time for us to strip those off and understand that we need to get rid of those and to participate with the Holy Spirit in getting rid of those. You know, as a um, mature believer in Christ, I've been a believer since July 16th, 1972. Uh, I know this, that as a young believer, I was easily tripped up with all kinds of things. And, you know, on Sunday, I would have a strong desire to live for God. And by Monday afternoon, it was gone. And I couldn't remember who God was many times and struggled like crazy with every besetting sin, every kind of thing that comes along that uh, drags away your attention. So he said, sin to God, I want you to see this clearly. Sin to God is anything that keeps you from enduring. It's anything that keeps you from hanging on during those times. It's anything that um, makes you unable to focus on the race set before you. He said, we need to be people who learn how to do this. We learn, need to learn how to win the race. You know, uh, my son ran cross-country track in high school, and uh, I watched him practice and watched him run those races one after another. Uh, he had to learn endurance for that, and he worked hard at endurance, at disallowing pain to rule his body or the discomfort of running to rule his body, to push himself uh, that's what he's talking about here, and he's talking about running the race, the, a race that is uh, unique to God's people where we have uh, laid out in front of us a track given by God, uh, a purpose given by God, and a limited amount of time to run it. And he says every sin that comes along is something that only takes up our time and destroys our ability. It, it becomes a weight to us something that destroys our ability to run the race well. So he says, understand that when God prescribed what sin is, he wasn't just trying to take away our fun. This is, as a young believer, it's easy to get into this mode where I'm thinking God just wanted to take over my fun. And so he disallowed uh, sin because he was disallowing fun. That's of course not true. He very much wants you to have fun. He wants you to have a great life. But he's telling you to strip off every sin or weight that holds you back because those are things that are uh, destructive to your ability to win. So we need to be people who win in life. God loves you and wants to see you run fast in this race. He wants to see you win in the race. To win in the race, we got to strip off the stuff, the stuff that uh, takes our time, the stuff that uh, destroys our ability to focus, the stuff that becomes uh, a weight to us. You know, we have all kind of things in life like this that are simply destructive to us in the sense that that um, they take up our time and they destroy our ability to focus. And we cause, we're caused to easily be distracted in life by them. So he says, strip off the weight so you can run this race. Strip off the weight so you can go in God and become somebody who can run fast. He wants you to win. This is more than just sin, however. In this case, he's talking about everything that holds you back, everything that makes you less ready for the fight or less able to, to win in the fight. And that could be all kinds of things. It could be uh, simply bad habits that you've picked up along life, that uh, along your way in life that become destructive to your soul. It could be um, you becoming somebody that is uh, not very Christ-like in one way or another and uh, can easily become distracted in that, just that it's not about him and about who he is. He says, learn to strip those off and become somebody who can really run in this race because you're going to need every ability to focus uh, throughout the race to get to the end and get there well. Then he says in verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, 
And now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Here he's talking about the champion of our faith, Jesus, and how we need to keep our eyes on him. Because, you know, there's a way for you to get your eyes off of Jesus and onto whatever people are talking about, whatever is going on in other parts of life that have no real consequence to your eternal soul. So focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus and know that he is the goal for us. Now, he, he's talking about Jesus' death and resurrection, how Jesus became uh, somebody who endured incredible things those last three days of his life. As he went to that cross and was uh, lied about and beat up and uh, uh, completely dishonored in front of people so that he could win an eternal honor. That's what it's talking about. So he says, keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on Jesus himself, who's the author and perfecter of your faith. Because uh, to keep your eyes on him makes you disregard all the other stuff that's happening around you. You know, this is where you say, I don't have time to get into an argument with somebody else. I'm too busy focusing on who Jesus is. I don't have a t time to worry about who is more popular or who is... Uh, being received better or any of that stuff that people get onto. I need to focus on just doing the best that I can. And to do that, I'm going to have to keep my eyes right on Jesus because he is what it is all about. I don't have time to get my eyes on um, uh, the uh, popularity struggles that are going on or the other issues that are happening in life because I got to keep my eyes on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and what he did. Uh, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. He's saying here, Jesus uh, understood that there would be great joy at the end of his refusing to get his eyes on the pain of the moment. Now, this takes enormous focus. And it was the kind of focus that caused him while they were putting nails in his hands to say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. It was the kind of focus that caused him to continue to bless the people that were hurting him instead of cursing them as every fiber of his being cried out to do, I would guess. It was uh, that kind of thing that kept him focused and so completely focused that he could go right to that cross and refuse to become uh, part of it, refuse to become... Uh, settled in, in all of its pain and all of its issues. He kept his eyes focused on the prize at the end. You know, the joy set before him was that Jesus would become the best known name under heaven, that he would become the power of God to us. He would become everything that God is to us. And uh, if all he needed to do was to keep his eyes focused on the goal. Uh, that's what he did throughout while they were lying about him, while they were making up situations about him, while they were uh, uh, defaming his name and mocking him, while they were uh, nailing his hands and feet to a cross. He, he kept his eyes focused on the goal at the end. The goal at the end was for the prize uh, set before him. He was the champion who initiates and perfects because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in a place of honor beside God's throne, saying, you know, a lot of us, would we would like greatness, but we're willing to uh, cut corners to get there. We're willing to... Um, become something we're not to get there, somebody that we're not to get there. And uh, Jesus was willing to go through the whole thing from the very beginning uh, without ever losing his focus because he knew there was joy awaiting him at the end. We keep our eyes on Jesus, not on relationships, not on other goals. We keep our eyes on Jesus trying to become like him in every way. So we're not easily distracted. We're not easily turned aside. We don't get petty or hostile or um, unable to focus in any way. We continue to focus by keeping our eyes on him. We see who he is. It was the cross that he endured 
uh, and uh, everything that life was about and what he fought for, that's what, uh, that, that's what we keep our eyes on at all points. So we think careful about what he said and how he said and, and uh, how that matters to us, how we can use it in our lives. Then in verse 3, look with me at verse 3. It says, think about all the hostility that he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. You know, Jesus endured so much hostility as he went to that cross. The hostility was, uh, th there were points where they spit on him. Can you imagine, have you ever been spit on by anybody? It's a horrible thing and incredibly debasing and humiliating to be spit on. He was spit on. He was whipped. Uh, 39 lashes that came down on his back was incredibly painful. And he had to uh, focus himself like crazy. And the Bible says, think about what he endured. Think about this. He was whipped s simply so we wouldn't have to be. Uh, he was mocked and made fun of. You know, they put a bag over his head and hit him and said, go ahead, prophet, prophesy who did that. Mocking his abilities and mocking everything about him. He says, think about what he endured. They put a robe on his wounds and led him away to Herod and then later ripped that robe off. Can you imagine the scabbing and the, the uh, uh, pain that that uh, involved in his bloody and bleeding back when they stripped that robe off again? Uh, and the robe was just a mockery. It was a royal robe that was mocking his um, ability to... Uh, walk in his anointing as the king of kings and the lord of lords he was lied about he was misquoted he was horribly misused yet he never changed his mind he never decided in the middle of that man this isn't worth it there's no way the joy set before me can be this much there's no way god can be about blessing me this much i'm going to walk away from it. never did he do that he kept himself focused and what he was doing there was giving us an example. He was saying, I could stay focused if he could stay focused. You know, I've had to face uh, a, a few things in my life. I've had to face people lying about me or people uh, misrepresenting me in some way. But I haven't had to face that. And, you know, the, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, you haven't given up your life for sin. He, he was saying, none of us who are reading this have had to die ourselves because of other people's sin, none of us. Um, he, he's just helping us to understand that we haven't given as much as Jesus has given. Jesus was not guilty. He was not, um, they weren't right in any of the accusations they made toward him. Yet he stayed focused the entire time and became somebody who endured to the end uh, by staying focused, by being somebody who was incredibly good at staying and completely being focused throughout all of his life while they lied about him and misquoted him and horribly misused uh, everything that he said. He steadily focused himself and, and became a winner through that. He did not allow other things to take over his mind. You know, there was many, many attempts. There was when the Apostle John uh, uh, wanted him to take thought about his mother. And he must have thought about the pain that she would face. And he assigned the Apostle John to her, never even losing his focus on us and on every one of our souls and uh, our ability to, uh, to learn how to focus as well. That's what he was about. He was somebody who was willing to become uh, horribly misused so that we would learn how to focus and how to become uh, clearer in our thoughts and clearer in our understanding of who he was and more and more focused about who, about where he was going because he was about the win. He'd come here with a job to do, was going to do that job no matter what. And he says in verse 4, after all, you've not given your lives in the struggle against sin. He's saying, listen, none of us have gone this far. We've not given everything we have in our struggle against sin. It's not as if we have uh, uh, sacrificed ourselves on the level that he did. He gave it all up, uh, allowing them to whip and beat and lie about and misrepresent and drag him from court to court 
and uh, uh, mistreat him every step along the way, putting a bag over his head and hitting him the whole bit. All of that was just to show that it could be done. Now, the whole purpose of Jesus' life is to show that it can be done. He came from obscurity and poverty to show that no matter what you've come from, you can make it. He came from um, being lost in the mass of humanity to emerging to show that it could be done. He came from nothing to go to the greatest name under heaven to show that it could be done. All of this was just him giving us an idea of what can happen. And he said, listen, in your struggle against alcoholism, you haven't given up yourself against sin. In your struggle against drugs or your struggle against um, whatever it is that you struggle with, you haven't given up yourself like he's given up himself. He gave up himself in every possible way because he was about the win. And you haven't given that much because you haven't suffered like he suffered. You haven't uh, gone to the level that he'd gone to to demonstrate his love for us. That's what he is about in every possible level. So if you think about what he endured, you think about who he is, you can become somebody like that. You can become somebody who's full of God and full of Jesus. You can become somebody who is uh, more than enough in every part and every area of life. Somebody who can overcome no matter what you're facing because he did. And if you focus yourself on him, your issues aren't so big after all. They become much, much, much smaller when you think about what he endured because none of us have endured anything like that. He endured the ultimate pain so that we wouldn't have to and so that we could be free from that. And, you know, we have all kinds of things coming at us. We have somebody who said whatever about us. We have somebody who's misrepresented us or lied about us. Everybody has those things on some level or another. But the difference with him is that Jesus never stopped. He never quit winning. He never stopped uh, trying to move forward throughout all that, throughout those most painful moments of his life. And he did all that for me, for us, for you, so that you could become somebody who that could focus yourself on him, become like him, grow into becoming like him, and um, lay aside all of that old stuff that you tried to leave behind. So maybe you have things that are holding you back. I wonder what they might be. You have um, sin that holds you back. You have uh, other thoughts that hold you back, other temptations or uh, ways that you think about life that hold you back. Those things can all be overcome by thinking about Jesus, by focusing on who he was, and by becoming like him in every way. That's his call on my life and on yours. And I'm so appreciative that you took the time to watch this with me today. I, I hope, like me, you're working at becoming as much like Christ as you possibly can. You ever have the thought you shouldn't do something and then you do it anyway? <laughs> well, this was one of those times and it, it nearly cost me my life. I woke up in the hospital. There was no memory of anything. But they kept me sedated for five days. There was a lot of people through the nature of it that had to take care of me, that had to help me to learn to speak even some again to get my muscles to work properly, to be able to walk properly. A lot of people cared for me, and that was just like one of the best things that could have happened for me. Early in my life, I struggled a lot with whether God was good, whether God was love or not. There was a lot of anger in the, in the household growing up and a lot of fear. I had been suicidal. I had suffered from severe depression to the point where I was even considered disabled. I couldn't work um, because I needed to get treatment. It costs me my the marriage, my family. I have two daughters, probably hardly anybody knows that. <laughs> I had renewed my desire and pursuit to, to seek after God and His will for my life. In the, in the process after the accident, it was a great time of seeking God, learning more about myself, 
and I would drive out here down 30 and I would see the billboard. The signs often were like, man, I really need to learn that. That would be really helpful for me. So I was trying to work up the courage to come in because if anybody knows me very well, I'm very shy, um, I can be in a crowd and disappear. It's, it's like a skill that I've honed. And my one brother said, oh, I used to go there. I was like, okay, great, let's go. <laughs> so Easter Sunday, about four and a half years ago, was my first visit here and I've been coming here ever since. One of the things that I believe God showed me was that I had to get involved. I did make a connection with Julie and I was talking with her some and she helped me get involved with different things and it turns out it was a, a lifesaver because it, it really kept me here. One of the thoughts that popped into my head was that I would help into kids. I laughed so hard and I was like very sarcastic at God. It's like, you got to be kidding me. There's absolutely no way. I carried on the anger that I learned growing up and it destroyed a lot of stuff. I thought there was no way that I would ever be able to be nice around kids. It, it destroyed my confidence greatly. It's a real, it's been a real blessing for me looking back to why I started that I'm able to be back there. Part of completing the Shining Stars Arena project is putting some trees in. And that has been roadblocks after roadblock after roadblock trying to get this accomplished. Before I was involved, there were many times when they had thought the trees were coming and it got canceled, they had to reschedule. Um, I don't really remember the exact details of how I got involved, but what I remember was Jerry saying something about this project and something inside me said, oh, you could do that. So I was like, okay, I could do that. <laughs> It's just something that needs to be done. Um, it needs to be accomplished, and I haven't felt the, the urge from God at all to stop. So anytime that I get the weather that seems to be decent and the ground stalled enough that I can do it, I come out and I throw a couple in. At times, I would uh, be a little frustrated and say, God, what in the world is going on here? <laughs> and one of those times, the thought came to my head. It's like, this is more about relationship than it is about planting trees. It's just one of those things. Sometimes you just really don't know the reason why God has you doing something. And you just you just do it just because you believe he's good and that good things are gonna come out of it. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> as far as the future of um, the next campaign and, and my involvement in it, I will be incredibly happy to see this project completed. I look forward to that day so it can feel like we can move on to the next part. There's a lot of vision here, and I don't have all of it, but I have vision for this part, and I'm happy to be able to help with it. So I see, I don't know, a long future here of keeping things in good shape and making it a beautiful place. And that, in turn, provides a great environment for people to feel welcome, and I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs>